Welcome to Raging Bullets, a DC Comics fan podcast, episode 452. Welcome to Raging Bullets. I'm Sean Whalen, Dr. Norge, and I'm joined as always by my co-host Jim. Keep Sean away from me. He's coming after me with a paint-by-numbers set. So says the sensei of the whatnot, Segulin, the Duke of You Know, and the elder statesman of the podcast. How's it going, eh? <laughs> <laughs> On this episode, we are going to be talking about Dark Knight 3, The Master Race, issue number one, Batman Europa number one. We're going to jump into Earth 2 Society with issue number six, and we're going to talk about the second issue of the Vertigo title, Art Ops. We are proud members of the Comics Podcast Network, the League of Comic Book Podcasts, the InfiniteComics.com Podcast Partnership. Jim, we are sponsored this episode, of course, as always, by the wonderful DCB Service. Service.com and InStockTrades.com. Can you talk to us a little bit about DCBService.com? Well, we are at the end of the month, but there is still time to order a Pama, the undiscovered animal from Hero Tomorrow Comics. It's a story straight from the jungle streets of Cleveland. You know, this is um, a book based on the really great movie Hero Tomorrow. And we talked about Hero Tomorrow. We've talked about a Pama. This is a really cool trade paper. Volume one. DCBS is right now offering a great 30 percent off price it's regularly 19.99 you can get it 13.99 but you can also go to your local shops and talk to them tell them hey order a pama order you know it's it's out there on diamond this is a really cool book really great people you know if you haven't given it a try check dcbs check with your local shop they can order it for you this is definitely a highly recommended and i know we're going to have them back on the show to talk a little bit more about you know the book and and go, you know, especially, you know, now that they've got a couple of trades, they got a trade out there. You know, this is volume one. So, you know, this is a great read and highly, highly recommended for you. You know, I want to shout out uh, InStockTrades.com. They have those deals of the week and there's some great books out there. Absolute Batman, the Court of Owls is 50% off, only $49.99. I Zombie Omnibus. We're talking in this episode about Michael Allward's work. I Zombie Omnibus hardcover, 50% off, only $37.50. Lex Luthor, a celebration of 75 years, 50% off, only $19.99. In their top sellers, number one, they have the Sandman Overture hardcover deluxe edition. That's 45% off, only $13.74. You know, the great thing that I always love about Instagram stocktrades.com is the just diverse range of books that you can get if you are looking for anything that is collected you want to be heading over to instocktrades.com to pick that up we want to thank both of those for sponsoring our show. Mr. Segulin, what kind of a podcast are we? Raging Bullets is a spoiler podcast. We go in-depth into plot lines, story twists, and whatnot of the comics we're discussing on today's show. So if you've ever read the books, you may want to come back later so you can better enjoy the show. So one, two, three, four. Jim, don't back away from the paintbrush. <laughs> 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 Let's talk some comics. <laughs> Our first discussion will be on Dark Knight 3, The Master Race. Pe uh, stories by Frank Miller and Brian Azzarello with pencils by Andy Kubert, inks by Klaus Jansen, colors by Brad Anderson, letters Clem Robbins, cover by Andy Kubert and Klaus Jansen, the variant covers by Jim Lee, Scott Williams, and Alex Sinclair, Frank Miller and Alex Sinclair, Dave Givens, Klaus Jansen, and Brad Anderson, and Jill Thompson, as well as well, multiple uh, retail variant covers that we are not going to go through the creative team at this point in time apologies to those there's just too many i think 47 is the number that i've heard and i did did you know that there was that many variants to this well um i got a bunch of variants when they came out mm -hmm. but i you know there's a i i kept seeing retail variants and there's different stuff that i'm assuming these are different retail stores can get different variants so if you want to get the full collection then you really got to do some work for it and i've got a couple but not not all of them. Nowhere near all of them. You know, and so it's, yeah. <laughs> oh, actually, what you said, I hope that's what's going on. Yeah. Because to me, I think that's a cool idea. 
You know, I mean, that's that's kind of a neat thing, you know, like kind of hop from retail shop to retail. That's fun. I mean, that that to me is kind of an interesting way to use variants is to kind of, you know, make people circulate and, and check out different shops and things. <laughs> if, uh, if and I don't know, I mean, and if there's a different online variants, I don't know. I actually, after we're done recording, I'm actually going to look up and try to find more information. Um, if you know the backstory of these variants and you want to call into the show, please do so. Because I'd honestly love to know more about this. I think it's very cool what they're doing. If that's what it is, I think that's an interesting way to use 47 variant covers. Yeah, that's um, what I thought how it was going on. And it's funny because um, I've got a bunch of people at work who listen to Howard and he was big on the getting the different variants and they're asking me about what's going on with this and all that kind of. So it's, it's again, once again, it's kind of neat that there's people who are outside the comic book universe who are looking at, you know, this and this is the iconicness of the story. So it's re- it's far reaching beyond just us. Yeah. Ralph called in on the Stern show and they were talking about uh, the sheer amount of Dark Knight variant covers and uh, but also the importance of the original story and how it was, you know, a game changer for comics. Actually, is, I want to talk about this story a little bit, you know, f- first impressions of it. I, I didn't know what to think about this. I read it through the first time because my experience was I grew up uh, being a huge Batman fan. Uh, my Budget shrunk around the time that the D- the original Dark Knight came out, and I had a few titles that I was getting, and I mean, I always had a few titles. I didn't have like a huge budget growing up, but I remember going to the comic shop and seeing the poster for this, and it was a prestige format. And the problem with prestige format when you don't have a budget, and back in the day was, this was in its infancy. It was this new thing. They were cool, but you had to be choosy about them because of the fact that, you know, for me, it ate up like, you know, three books <laughs> you were getting <laughs> in order to to get this. Man, was the first issue of that. And straight on through, was that series worth it? At the time, such a game changer. And, you know, the story of uh, Bruce Wayne being retired, you know, and this is years later. They're really telling a Batman story that wasn't really told to this level previously. You know, we'd had the Earth 2 Batman who, you know, gone off and done his thing, but it wasn't like this. This was a very contemporary Batman who had retired and, you know, it was pulled back in by everything going on around him, the ambivalence and the city falling apart. And, you know, he was pulled back to his mission again and found that he had a thirst for it that took this man who was much older and made him feel young again. And the lines and the dialogue that Frank Miller wrote for that and the artwork was for the whole book was just stunning. And I just remember there's so many lines in, in that book that were just so fantastic that I really just loved it. It was a very rich story that had every beat that you could imagine uh, from encounters with the Joker to Superman, to a new Robin to, you know, just, it just hit everything. So, that story happened, and then DK2 came around. I don't know if I ever fairly judged it or not. I, I don't know you know, wh- what the story was there with me. I remember reading it and going, what is this? <laughs> <laughs> and I, I didn't hate it, per se, but I certainly wasn't a fan of the original you know, DK2 reading when I went through on it. I remember it was something I read once and then just kind of dismissed it. We did it on the show years later, and I remember – talking to you about it going, I'm anxious to read it again because I have this real vivid impression of it, but I haven't really read it much. And we did it on the show and I found myself liking it. I read it through again. And I, I think what it was is I re- was able to read it this time as its own contained piece. And I found that I enjoyed it. Uh, it certainly wasn't the level of Dark Knight Returns for me, but I found that it was something where I'm like, I enjoyed the experience of this. So this one rolled around and I was excited about it, but tentative. Because I'm like, is it going to be more Dark Knight Returns, or is it going to be more DK2, um, or is it going to be some other thing altogether? I found myself shocked when I read the first issue, mainly because of the fact that there was so there was Batman in it, but it wasn't Batman. He almost seemed to be a background character, whereas Superman and Wonder Woman and La- Lara and the whole story going on there, and then the Adam backstory, they seem to be so much in the forefront. I do think these stories are going to eventually converge, and I'm going to get what I'm looking for there. I don't take that the wrong way as I disliked it. I didn't. I found like in the second and third read through, I actually really liked it. But I'm liking it for reasons that I didn't expect. Like I'm my favorite character, and this is the Adam right now. <laughs> I mean, and the whole Superman and Wonder Woman stuff. 
I'm intrigued, especially seeing Carrie Kelly again, who's I think an amazing character because that's who that was under the cowl, right? Oh yeah, yeah, that had to be her. Yeah, so like I'm excited about seeing her and where that story's going. Uh, what's really going on with Bruce? Because he's not dead, right? Uh, come on, yeah, he, he can't be. He, he, who knows what's going on with him or where he is? But he's not dead, and it's oh, you know, it's you know, it's he's gonna make his appearance, and that's you know, I'm assuming that's where the story's really gonna get ramped up, dark nighty. Mm-hmm. And I hope so too. What were your inf- initial impressions of this, Jim? Well, you know, you and me, we've got completely different dealings with uh, the whole Dark Knight uh, Returns universe because I really didn't read it when it came out. I read it, you know, later. I'd heard about just the the story and just how groundbreaking and epic it was, but I didn't really at the time read it. And then when Dark Knight Two came out, I never read that until we did it for the show because every single time I talked to a person about it, they all said it was just the absolute horrible worst thing to read and so if i didn't need to read it i didn't read it you know but when we did it for the show i actually wasn't as bad off for me i saw it as a great you know you know justice league story inside the dark knight returns universe and eventually bruce does go into the forefront of it and it becomes a dark knight story but for me it was really just the strength of a rebirth of the justice league and i even remember you know like the first uh, issue or even the first two issues i was thinking that's all it was going to be was just a justice league story which i was kind of like okay that's kind of neat you know to give us that you know so with this one when we get the opening where we do see kind of a batman but he as you said he really was kind of a supporting character and i'm um, you know the the characters that are getting fleshed out and actually doing stuff are the characters that aren't batman so it's again to me it was the ba- the dark knight universe's story and i kind of like that i think you know i'm oh. i really i enjoyed this because you know i'm i'm looking forward to, for bruce showing up i'm looking forward to be dark knighty but I'm not at a point where I have to have that right now. I'm with you. See, yeah. So don't take my comments as I didn't like this. I did. I really did like it. Um, I think the first time through, I was tentative in the sense that I think I was expecting more Batman by the nature of the title. Uh, But I'm intrigued with the story. I think what it was is I'm curious to see where this story is going with the civilians versus the police. Because we've seen that before, I think because it hits so close to what's going on contemporary right now, I'm a little uncomfortable with it, if that <laughs> makes any sense. Yeah. Only because, you know, I'm, I, I consider myself an empathetic person. You know, I'm, I'm very pro-police, but I'm also pro-people. You know, I guess I'm one of those people that I try to see both sides of an argument. And I think I have in, in the situations that have been happening lately in the media. I have a great deal of respect for the dangers of being a police officer. I also have a great deal of respect for what people go, traumas people go through. So, you know, it's, I'm kind of in a very mixed place with all of that, to be honest. Um, because I, you know, it's when you're not directly connected to one side, you're not directly connected to the other and you're trying to be understanding. It kind of puts you in an uncomfortable place. So I think there's a little bit of that going on with me right now. Uh, and I, I'm maybe not giving that story a chance. I did find in my second and third read throughs, what I really found I was focusing on and enjoying more that I didn't in my first read through was the commissioner Yindel pieces where I'm like, Oh wow. You know, this is a strong commissioner who we know in the past has not much cared for Batman, but on the other, because she was handed the torch by Jim Gordon. But on the other hand, we know this is somebody who's ethical and fair and things like that. When you see this character clearly being dictated by the media and by PR people inside the police department, you know, you start to sit there and say, this is a character who doesn't want to be a puppet, who is clearly being pushed and pawned off to be a little bit more one than usual until you start to see, you know, get in front of the mic and have actual things happening. I did love the bits when we finally found out that underneath the cowl, it was Carrie Kelly. I did not see that coming. Uh, I thought it was going to be in it. Cause when you finally start to see the character up close, you realize it's not big enough to be Bruce and the costume doesn't really quite fit. Yeah. I was expecting it to be uh very similar that we've had in, you know, DK two and, and, and actually somewhat in dark Knight, where he started inspiring um, that these were some of the gangs or some of the people that he has inspired to step up, uh, not thinking that it would be, you know, a direct Robin, so to speak. I liked, I actually quite liked that. I thought the cliffhanger ending was phenomenal, but getting there was an interesting journey for me. Yeah. It's you know interesting that how you know, they've got the opening panels 
where they show the cowl in the case and then the glass shattering and then the empty case, you know, the significance of that was, I will admit, was lost on me during my first read through. Mm -hmm. It wasn't until after, you know, I read and I saw that how that, you know, there was Carrie under the cowl and it was somebody else, you know, that the the significance of that kind of was like, oh, okay, so that was her grabbing the cowl and throwing it on and, you know, and returning. So, you know, that again asked, you know, got me asking questions about, okay, what is, you know, what's going on here? You know, and because again, it goes right into, right from there, it was so, I was so focused on, you know, the kid running from the cops and, you know, him almost getting gunned down and then Batman showing up and just everything that was going on. Cause I loved how the visual element in these pages where it was very bright, but it wasn't clean. They still maintain that grit and dirt that is Gotham, especially using the reds and the blues that are, you know, the lights coming from the, uh, you know, the police, uh, you know, the police uh, sirens, you know, and just, and I loved how they kept going back and forth between the panel of red, blue, red, blue, and just, you know, that really great focus until you get the actual images that the kids taking of the bat taking down the cops. And I was like, wow, that, that again, that was a really cool laid out piece where like, you it's you know, when you stop and you think about you know batman beating up cops and were they just going to gun down this kid for no reason you know when you start thinking those lines you you can't very easily get a little oh, i don't know if we should be doing this story but when you look at just how the story is presented <laughs> you know and how they did it i'm like man this is this is a great way to tell this story it's you know not what? What? We're both a lot more excited about the Batman story than we're realizing. Yeah, I know. Because yeah. as we're, we're talking about this, I'm like sitting here, I'm like, you know, I think I started off my first read through not very excited about the Batman story. And now after like a couple of read throughs and, and it's an example of letting an idea germinate, yes. you know, and it kind of like gets there. I'm like, you know, what? I really am very excited about the Batman piece of this. I didn't. <laughs> I, I'm going to be I, honest I, with you. I'm really just discovering this now as we're talking it through and I'm finding <laughs> it fascinating. I'm like, you know what? For as much as I'm liking the other stuff now, the Batman stuff really is pushing ahead for me. <laughs> well, see, I'll be honest with you. I'm still, for me, the uh, the Wonder Woman, the uh, the Wonder Woman, Superman, uh-huh. and their daughter uh, Lara story kind of does have me still. You know, it does still have me edge. I've got that great sequence of Batman, but then. Really beyond that, I'm like, oh, okay. And then you go, because it, again, it's a great opening where it goes bam and hits you. Sure. And then it starts building the other story. So it's, you know, those moments. And, you know, so it's, again, I still look at this as a Batman universe story, not a Batman story and or a Dark Knight story. You know, it's, you know, kind of, but it's still, there is still those elements there. So I know by issue two, probably I'm assuming we'll have more of a, Dark Knight story. I think this is an idea that does need to germinate. And I think that's what it is. I think there's uh, big things going on here. Uh, the master race I'm assuming is going to be the Kandorians. I don't know how true that is, but all signs seem to be pointing to that. I really enjoyed the Ray Palmer backup. Uh, that's an example of just really writing a character very well. I loved his inner dialogue where, you know, he was talking about how the Justice League came to be and how the just why how and why the Justice Trinity didn't work work as a name. <laughs> so it led to the league growing. And how each of the other members that weren't the Trinity came up on board in their own unique ways, and Hal being the most reluctant to be a part of the team. But Ray's own feeling about what he was to the group. I really like a Ray Palmer that Sometimes Ray is written very wooden and very smart and not identifiable as a human, if that makes any sense at all. In these moments, he's got every bit of those smarts and that intelligence and things that we like about him. But I like the humanity of him, you know, talking about, you know, his failed relationship, talking about uh, his insecurities with the team and what he brings to the table, but then also seeing a lot of strength in what he actually does bring to the table and how he analyzes the situation and ultimately how the Kandorians and Lara come to him about this. Hey, they want, they want to be big again. Yeah. <laughs> Talk about taking a long time to kind of decide, Hey, you know what? I want to be taller. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting story. I want to know what's driving it. Like who is the mastermind behind the Kandorians? Is it inside, outside the bottle? I don't know. 
But there's there's the big story there, the what's going on with the Kandorians. Yeah, I'm assuming I'm agreeing with you that it's the Kandorians are going to be the quote unquote master race, because uh-huh. when this thing first got announced, I assumed it was going to be a full, you know, a full turn for Superman. And he was going to go, you know, ba- basically get sick of humanity and just conquer it. You know, and he was going to be the master race and yada, 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 and maybe even Wonder Woman and their daughter. And it would be that whole, cause you think about a couple of moments in dark Knight too, where they kind of looked like they were getting ready to turn and they were getting ready to change some stuff. And, you know, so I was thinking this is going to continue on in three, but we see he's a super popsicle and, you know, Wonder Woman's still doing her thing where she, you know, she's, she completely beats up this Minotaur with a baby strapped to her back, which I thought was cool sequence of, again, just Wonder Woman being Wonder Woman, you know, especially in this universe, this version of Wonder Woman is very much hardcore warrior. And I loved seeing that we still have that element to her. And, you know, so it's, to me, that's it's not going to make sense that they're going to be the master race. They're, it looks like they're still going to be our heroes. And so enter the Kandorians. You know, I think that'll be kind of an interesting seeing how they get you know bigger, how what happens to them. Were they always just going to plan on conquering but couldn't because of size? You know, what you know, what's the element there? And is that going to bring, you know, you know, is that going to bring Clark out of his shell? So to speak, yeah. yeah. I, I, I'm finding the oh, and you know we can't argue the fact that Wonder Woman's got this new child, yeah. You know, so we got Jonathan in there, and I really liked that element of it. I would have been disappointed if Clark turned full on turned, and you could be very right. That might actually still happen or be a piece of this. I don't see that being the case, and I know you're not saying that you do either, so don't don't take me wrong there. But I'm really liking the fact that. It feels like the Kandorians are going to be these players in this game, and it adds an interesting element to the story because now you've got a bunch of Supermen running around. Yeah, anytime they introduce a large group of Kryptonians, it never ends well, Mm -hmm. just because it's... You know, maybe put them on Mars or put them somewhere else away from Earth because every story, time they've done a storyline where they've brought back, you know, a large group of Kryptonians, whether it's them intentionally or people afraid of a, uh, a city of, of supermen or whatnot, there, it always, something always goes horribly wrong with the experiment. And I'm, I'm curious to see if that's how, you know, how that's going to happen, you know, where that's going to play out, what's going to be that that linchpin that finally sets them off. I think one of the things that I'm really enjoying about this element of the story is the fact that, you know, when you take a look at this, in the Dark Knight universe, we've had like a fragmentation of the Justice League, you know, where they're really broken into two camps. Um, those were pro-Batman, those were pro-Superman, you know, and yeah. it kind of, there was a division there between the teams. I think we're going to see a reason for them to come together again. I'm kind of excited about that because this puts them in a justice society kind of thing. You know, these are the aging heroes, you know, (laughs) and they've got to step back up again. And do they still have enough to be able to take down in many ways? It makes this story far more interesting because our heroes are far more vulnerable because of their age. So are they going to rally cry the people together? Uh, Is this going to be, you know, uniting police and citizens and the heroes against this common enemy? I don't know. I'm really excited about where this storyline is going to go. The more that I think about it, it's been an interesting journey with this first issue for me, though, because I, after reading the first issue, I enjoyed it. I wasn't excited reading it the second time through. The third time through, these ideas started to manifest, and I started to get really, really into it. I, as of when you and I started chatting, I had a very different impression on what I thought about the Batman story and how much I was digging it. And now I'm realizing, no, I'm fascinated by the Batman story. I like want more, <laughs> <laughs> and I'm really, literally just discovering it now as we're chatting. I'm like, oh man, there's a lot more of these ideas that I'm really like are manifesting in this story, which is a good thing for a prologue, you know, an introduction, introductory chapter to do. I think this is a four issuer, right? Yeah, I believe so. But I, I'm I'm really digging it now, and and what's happening here? Yeah, yeah, well, they're doing a good. They're building the story in a really good way because we do get that 
boom pop of um of the the coolness of batman you know the beginning and the end because i agree with you that was a great you know a great way to cliffhanger at the end when they pull off the mask and it's you know carrie kelly underneath you know the underneath the cowl and she says bruce wayne is dead you know but those were some great moments but you know again it's this these wonder woman sequences for me you know one great fighting but just that, that really cool inner dialogue and that just that explanation of who they were and what they did and why they did you know kind of giving you the just that inner her look uh, her look and her opinion of who they were and you get that great sequence when she's back on the island and i i still do chuckle with you know um the one amazonians coming up to her oh i'll take the boy to my queen and she's got the sword to her throat and it was just instinct on wonder woman oh sorry here and it, the thing that cracked me up the most though was she's moving in to take the baby but instead she gets the sword and somebody else gets the um gets the baby and i thought that just that, again that kind of sequences you know just kind of had me chuckling because especially with you know, you'd think that you know, with the sisterhood and everything, you know, they'd be passing the baby around and it'd be really happy, wonderful. No, you know, she almost got her head taken off. <laughs> I love this line from Ray Palmer. And now it appears you've sentenced that poor girl you love to a fate worse than death. Batman, indeed. Do you have any idea what they'll do to her? They'll pin her down and dissect her. With you dead? They'll make her their face of fear. Wait. Is that your intention? So I love that he's trying to figure out what Batman's doing. And, yeah. and you know, obviously putting Carrie in place as a symbol, for what reason? I, I can't wait to see what's going to happen there with Carrie and, and what Batman's really trying to rally. There's a strategy going on here. And I can't wait to see what Bruce was up to and how in the know Carrie is. Yes, that's what you got to wonder is – is she in the know? Is she operating and Bruce is letting this happen? You know, because when you're dealing with Batman, just the strategy that he lays out, you never really see it coming. Batman didn't. See- <laughs> <laughs> Batman would never use the word strategy. <laughs> <laughs> Give me a battering. I still chuckle upset. when I throw that word in. <laughs> <laughs> I think I'm the only one still, but hey. <laughs> no, no, I think there's a lot of people who chuckle along. No, there, it's funny because there is a couple moments that with with uh, the Carrie Batman that I really did. I liked how she was moving and she did a really good job in the cowl. You know, oh, yeah. it's definite she does have, you know, she has had the training. And we saw in two, she wasn't pursuing the cow. She wasn't pursuing the Robin. She was pursuing more of the Catwoman persona. So for her to shift from that to this, you know, it's kind of interesting. But again, she took them. She got, you know, thumped really, really good. But in the end, you know, you look at that p- picture all the cops are laid down and, you know, he granted she's arrested and demasked, but you know, she did take them down. So it's kind of interesting to see, you know, what she was able to do and how much, how, how tough she's become over the years. You know, one of the things I really enjoyed about this story uh, was the artwork in both, you know, you have Andy Kubert and Claus Jansen and you know, the whole team did a, just a bang up job in this, but in the backup, you've got, uh, Frank Miller, you know, on the artwork. And uh, again, you know, another stellar art team doing the story because it was uh, pencils by Frank Miller, inks by Klaus Jansen, colors by Alex Sinclair. I mean, really good looking stuff. I like the gritty nature of the art styling of this. You know, I was a big fan of uh, Miller's work on Daredevil, uh, especially the Born Again story. And I can't recommend that highly enough. If you've, if you're mainly a DC reader and you've never read any Daredevil, Frank Miller's Daredevil, all of it is phenomenal. <laughs> and just grab it. I mean, it's really. Have you read a lot of that stuff, Jim? Or what, what is? I, I know no. you're. Oh yeah, Frank Miller's Daredevil stuff is on my short list. If I was going to recommend real quality material, his his Daredevil stuff. I remember Born Again. It's that's a story I go back and read every year. The Born Again storyline. Uh, it's, it's a big uh, Daredevil versus Kingpin story. And I'm not going to spoil it, any of it, other than that. And it's, it's, a, it's a story. I will say this. It's a story of going to your darkest place and fighting your way back to redemption. And I will leave it at that. 
and say that it's so masterfully done. Uh, and really, it's a story that I think remains contemporary for me. It's kind of ageless, and I can't recommend it highly enough as being a story. So this, it's funny how I'm, I'm really starting, this is more we're talking about this book, I'm connecting it with what I really love the most about the work of Miller, and now with Azzarello on, and just the whole art team. This really is a nice blending, and I'm finding an excitement for this that I didn't have for DK2. And I say that with respect for the fact that I've my feelings on DK2 has changed greatly over the years where I enjoy the story now. But this I loved. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it was an interesting journey to get there. But by the end of my third read, I found that I really loved this story. And honestly, it's, the more we talk, like it, I'll be honest, when we're done recording tonight, I'm going to read this again. Yeah. So that says a lot about the story because I'm finding like, oh, I've got like different thoughts about this now. I'm more interested in this Batman story now. I kind of want to read it again and see how I feel about the whole thing reading it again. That, that's what's fun about talking about this. Uh, do you want to talk Batman Europa? Oh, sure. All right. So speaking of Batman miniseries, let's talk about Batman Europa. Issue number one is called Berlin. The story is by Matteo Casali and Brian Azzarello. Layouts by Giuseppe Camac. Coley, Camun Coley, pencils and finishes by Jim Lee, colors by Alex Sinclair, letters Pat Brousseau, cover sketch variant Jim Lee, variant cover Lieber Mayo, assistant editor is David Pina, the group editor is Jim Chadwick, Batman created by Bob Kane with Bill Finger, I butchered names there, I know it, and I'm very sad about it. You know what I'm really excited about these first two that we've talked about on this episode? I have been a big fan of Batman miniseries. And I'm talking about Batman miniseries that are out of the traditional continuity, where you you know, you got creators who just are playing around with let's tell a really interesting Batman story and play around with timelines and time frames. And this is happening in this era of his life. This is happening in this universe for him. And it's it's where I think you get some really interesting creativity. This was a great, like, I was really excited to read this one. I forgot this one was coming out. So when I started opening it up, I was really into it because I didn't remember this. This was totally under my radar. Like, were you aware this was a thing and that we were going to be able to read it this week? I f did not think it was coming out this week. You know, like, yeah, I completely, it, it, I was, I'm ordering it when I, you know, when it comes out. So you know, I had, you know, it's, it's in my queue to get and everything like that from, you know, so I was, I, I was aware of it, but I didn't realize now it was being released. You know, I was, I think I was so focused, excuse me, I was so focused on with, cause I knew DK3 was coming out and I knew everything going on with, you know, the Robin Wars coming out and all these other things that I completely forgot Europa was coming out this week. So it was kind of neat when, you know, when I saw it, you know, and I saw it as out there, I was like, oh, let me make sure I read that. And then you and I were talking, hey, let's talk about this. I'm like, OK, no, I definitely got to make sure I read this thing. And I was very happy and very, um, again, like you, I liked this Batman miniseries that's not exactly in the continuity. That's its own little Elseworld type story. I like seeing classic Joker. Now, don't get me wrong. I love everything they're doing with him now. So don't take that as a negative. It was kind of fun to see. These two giants, you know, these characters that are so iconic, you know, having their kind of, I never thought it would end like this, him, me, our blood on each other's lips, you know, the, the battle that the two of them are, are going through right now, you know, here's the issue. I first read that the first time through, and I saw the two of them fighting. Now, reading the first issue and then going back through and reading it again, I wonder if that's the two of them still fighting to survive. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think that, yeah, I, I completely agree with you. First thought, I was reading like, oh, we're going to get an epic battle to the death. And then you realize as the story goes on, you're like, oh, that uh, that opening has a completely different opinion, especially when I went back and reread the second time on that second page mm -hmm. where Bruce is talking about how he's laughing, you know, and, you know, it's, you know, kind of like the thing you see him kind of helping the Joker up. It's not a, cause you know, when I first read it through, you see him, you know, Joker hunched over. I was one, kind of thinking, is he giving him a, a gut punch there? And I, I wasn't thinking him, but it, he's actually helping Joker up. 
So these two are working together in this sequence. And I was like, that's kind of neat that, you know, completely thinking one thing and then second read through, you know, it's something different. This was a visual treat. Like I really found this to be an art page turner. Like when you flip over to that opening page with the, with the credits and you see just Gotham, I just, I don't know. I really love the artwork, the art style. Uh, What I love about it is, I'm a big fan of art and comics when the story has substance too. you know, and you get everything like that's the greedy part of me. It's like, wow, we got a really interesting story. We've got really great artwork. This is like everything that I love comics for. This is a tour de force. The thing I loved about this the most is I forgot about this book. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and it was like such a nice, su- pleasant su- – you talk about palate cleansers. You know, you always throw that one out there. This was like – I love that my palate cleanser was this really awesome Batman story, the Killer Croc fight sequence where we're seeing – like I was thinking to myself, like is this Batman – is Batman older? here what's going on that he's having trouble taking down croc because he's referencing that he's not as strong as he used to be so what's going on with him and we start to find out that he's sick you know through that fight and we see alfred having that dialogue with him i really loved the whole intro journey the croc fight was super cool uh i like that this story kind of dropped us in in the middle of events with questions yeah like what was happening in the beginning What's happening now with Batman and this croc battle? Where do these events take place in relation to each other, timeline wise? And what is going on with Batman? Like, what did you think Batman initially? I thought initially when I did my first read through, I thought initially maybe Batman's getting older. Uh, and I think that was probably because I read this right around reading Dark Dark Knight 3, <laughs> Master yeah. Ace. So I'm kind of like, oh, wow. Okay, we got an older Batman with this whole thing as well. But I love seeing him fight Killer Croc because it's just this really strong, insane beast that keeps coming at him. Like, Killer Croc does not cower off. Killer Croc keeps coming. So Batman can't, like, let his guard down. He's got to take this beast out. And there's always an after effect to that battle, whether Batman's, you know, sick or not. And I really quite en- enjoyed that aspect of it. Sometimes it's good to read a, a Batman story where Batman's a little vulnerable because to me, it's all the more impressive when you see him, like, how is he still picking himself up? What is keeping him on driving and fighting? That determination is something I've always admired in the character of Bruce Wayne when they use him as Batman like this. And I think this story really shows that drive and determination of him. I do, you know, the other thing is too, it's really great to see the classic bat suit. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. And I like you, I like the new costume and I really dig it. But it is sometimes cool to see somebody go back to old school. And you mentioned with the the classic Joker, same thing. Uh Sometimes I do like seeing a new active story that has the old look to it. And it doesn't take anything away from what's currently going on. But I I do dig this. And like with you, I was wondering what's going on. I actually was also thinking maybe an older Bruce was dealing with this and I I could tell right away that it was a, the initial was, you know, like present day. And this was a flashback to lead up to that moment. Again, I didn't know that Joker and Bruce were working together, but you know, it it looked to me, I I was thinking it was a fight, you know, was why those two were bloodied. They're beating up on each other, but yeah, it was kind of neat that you go back through and you see him sick and they start laying down the, you know, the actual, you know, the, the giving you the clues, because I always thought that's a great thing when you, the Batman stories have kind of like a little bit clues along the way where you can maybe figure out some of the stuff going on. Like yeah. they laid out enough details with that opening sequence with them battling it out. And then later, when we realize Bruce is sick, you I probably could have put two and two together and realized that Joker was sick as well and everything that was going on there. But again, it wasn't until really they put all the pieces together for me that you saw it. So I really liked how the story laid out. So then my second and third read throughs, you're really going, Oh yeah. Okay. There, see that, you know, and it it was kind of neat just to, again, 
you know, how they played out. And you're seeing how Bruce, even though we now know he's got a week to live <laughs> and he's fighting Croc, who is just this pure beast of strength and power, not finesse, not anything he could use the fear end of, you know, of what he does. He's got to just pummel him and beat him down. And that was kind of cool seeing, you know, Bruce have to work harder than normal, but still take him down. I liked the build up to... You know, as you saw, like him walk in there and find out about Colossus and the virus. I like that Alfred had an active role in the detective work. I'm a big fan of Alfred being this, you know, major player. And Alfred doesn't, you know, Alfred's not just eye candy. <laughs> you know, <laughs> Alfred's really there. He's done a lot of the preliminary work. He's he's a part of Team Batman. Bruce defers to him. They start having really open dialogue where Alfred's an active participant. I know you're a big fan of Tim Drake like I am. And one of the things I think we both really enjoy about that character is the fact that when you get a really great dialogue between Bruce and Tim, and it's really well written, you see that he defers to Tim in the same way because of Tim's Tim's intelligence, his smarts with computers, his ability to research and things like that. That's what separates Tim from Alfred. In the fact that that's what he brings to the table. I really like seeing these moments with Alfred, remembering what Alfred brings to the table as being really the consummate partner and the constant person he can brainstorm off of because Alfred just brings that intelligence and experience to the table. Oh, God, yeah. yeah. And it's funny because with looking at this is obviously not current universe. So you you do wonder, is there a Tim? Is there only a Dick Grayson? What's, you know, who is there? Who is the Robin? Is there any right now? So having Alfred, you know, be the person who's working at the computer, who's being the support was kind of really glad to see because like you, Alfred, it, to me is a great character and a great part to have in this. And I liked how the one thing, the sequence that I noticed the first read through, but every time I read through, I still say that's an awesome sequence when they're talking to Bruce and he knows it's killing him and he can see the effects on his hands. Afterwards, he puts the glove, not only does he put the glove back on, but he pulls the cowl back up, you know, to basically mask the weakness and the sickness that he has. And he's still interacting and dealing with Alfred, but it's kind of a, you know, whether it's a mental thing for him to, to keep, you know, not to let it get him down or whether it's kind of a moment. So Alfred doesn't see the weakness and Alfred doesn't fret. And he's this, so, you know, Bruce can remain this iconic Batman. Who can defeat anything? I thought that was a kind of a cool moment where you know Bruce suits back up again, even though he's still in the um, he's still in the cave. It's game on. Yeah, you know, it's really at that point. It's like you know, I can't afford to feel pity for myself. I can't afford to die. I can't afford to give up. It's drive and determination. Uh, I'm always, you know, as far as when people are sick and you see people's drive and determination, I think, you know, it's such a real thing and I admire it greatly. I've had two parents who've gone through, um, you know, horrible bouts with cancer, but what I admire the most about them in it is the fact that, you know, they they had a drive to kind of keep living and to put on brave faces for their family. You know, both of my parents at various times have hidden you know, what they were really going through uh, in order to kind of be a positive uh, person, you know, in the experience you're at, whether it's a holiday setting or a gathering or a get together. And it's the mask. It's the mask that you see Batman put on. I think it's a very real thing. And this is an example of art imitating life where you see Batman, you know, putting on the mask, getting back into the Batman zone talking to Alfred, it's business as usual because it has to be that way. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to do everything I can to survive this. And the only way it's going to happen is if I go to Berlin and follow the clues to see where they lead. Yeah. And I like, you know, again, with the Europa, because when this thing first came out, it was Batman in Europe. And that's the only thing I really thought and knew about this. I was, you know, So I remember when it was first announced, I was like, oh, that should be kind of neat. You know, Batman not in Gotham. You know, so I was looking forward to that. But as we're really seeing this layout and as we always talk about how Gotham is a character in the best Batman stories, well, they're making sure we know 
Berlin is a character in this story. Yes. Prague is up next. And I'm assuming Prague's going to have that same impact and that really, you know, that relationship. And I like the fact that it, you kind of you're seeing that Gotham isn't just Gotham. There's a piece of, piece of Gotham in every city out there. There's that grit, that balance of, you know, light and dark. Two, there's, you know, two sides to Gotham and every city has those two sides. And I like, I loved how they really brought that out in Berlin and just, and not just even the Checkpoint Charlie stuff, just the, the history that is Berlin and everything that's gone on there. So I thought it was, I was like, man, that, that's kind of neat how they're, they're, they're making that comparison for us. You know what I loved when he was jumping off that building, you know, moored murder, he covered up his face with the cape. I don't, at first I thought it was due to the sickness and I'm like, no, it's also to mask the only part of his body that's not really covered by a mask or gloves or a cape, you know, yeah. to kind of keep that dark night uh, symbolism. You know, it's, it's really covering like what Dracula does almost. Yeah. And I thought just, that was a really great art sequence. I always love the way Jim Lee draws Batman being athletic like that. I think it just really stands out. I, I like you and you were right to say so earlier, really like the new outfit, but man, when you see these sequences, I'm like, man, did that whole outfit really look good on a page <laughs> when the right oh, artist yeah. really tackles it. They really know how to make that thing work. Yeah. That sweeps when he's jumping in. That is a, just an awesome look. You know, because you, yeah, I agree with you completely. How he's got the mask covering over, and just that 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 one panel there was really just outstanding. Mm -hmm. So then, you know, the setup is that it looks like the Joker's the one that's causing all this with the the Joker gas and things like that. And you know, what what's his end game this time? So Batman's again shuffling through clues that lead him to a confrontation with Joker before he tries to kill off was it Marlene? Yeah, Marlene. And you know, Batman shows up on the scene, not realizing that the Joker's looking for the same information <laughs> that he is. The Joker's trying to save himself because he's got the same disease. So they're trapped with a girl who's a cyber hacker. There seems to be a connection between that and what happened to the two of them. So now it's the three of them on the run trying to figure out and get the clues that's leading them to Prague. And I really loved the sense of adventure, the sense of travel. This is stuff, you know, I grew up reading and loving 70s Batman. I mentioned this, I think, in the last episode. I did you know, kind of a rant about this. I always loved the jet setting Batman. What I love about this, this shows you can do this with any Batman <laughs> and yeah. really have oh, yeah. some fun with it. This is very much the dark brooding Batman. And I love that this character feels just as cool jet setting around having to work with the Joker and this Marlene to try and come to a conclusion as far as who's behind this, why are they doing it? And how are they going to get themselves out of this mess before they die? I loved, you know, when Bruce sweeps in there, because you know, at first you're thinking, okay, he's just saving the day. But no, he wants answers from her. And even as he's staring down Joker, he throws the intimidation at her. Don't I, you know, I wouldn't move, you know, you know, to basically don't move. You don't want me to chase you. I love just how, you know, as he's confronting Joker, he's still throwing the fear of bat at her. That was just a really cool moment. And then just again, classic Joker Batman fight sequence where, you know, he's initially just, you know, Joker's just shooting off at him. They're throwing down and bobbing and weaving. And, you know, I, I did chuckle you know, with, you know, where Joker's talking about how when, you know, with the messenger, he goes, sorry, I didn't follow messenger protocol. Don't kill the messenger. Eh, not to the Joker. You see just the image of the guy with the Joker face on. I love that. That was, again, Funny moments within the story that doesn't take away from the action, doesn't take it away from just the seriousness and the grit of it. Yeah, and that part's really important to me. Um, I love humor in comics. You know, we talked about it when we were talking about Secret Six previously. I love humor when it's balanced. The balance of humor in a Batman story is very different than the balance of humor in Secret Six, Ambush Bug, uh, Dr. Fate, any countless myriad of DC books that have every so often a chuckle moment or an endearing moment or something like that. It's just got to really fit the balance of the tone of that book. 
I, <laughs> you need me. <laughs> I'm touched. <laughs> yeah, now, I didn't take it that she's going with them to Prague. I thought it was just the two of them. I don't. Because mm. when I first read that out, that was my thought. But when you mentioned it, I'm like, oh, that'd be kind of neat if she does come along. Because maybe he's going to need her for more of the uh, security of the hack of the, you know, the foul of money. You know, well, where it's going through. Because she's she had contact with a person called Trojan Horse. You know, so she was initially contacted to, you know, you know, to you know, infect the back computer. And that's all she knows. But she does have an account where the money she got paid. You know, so there is going to be, she maybe will have more information. So the thought of having the three of them on the road is kind of interesting. But I read it that it's just going to be the two of them. Kind of a of very, very twisted and weird version of the hard traveling heroes. And I can see that being the case. And I'm perfectly fine with that. I think I guess was just, I was assuming because it's like a cyber crime that they right. would need her, but I totally see your point too. So I don't know that I have a feeling or a preference yeah. as far as where that's going to go. So you want to talk earth Two society? Yeah. Our next discussion is on earth Two society. Number six, the writer is Daniel Wilson with Ellison, uh, Borges uh, as artist, Alejandro Sanchez and Blonde on colors, Travis Lanham on letters, Jorge Jimenez and John Roch on cover, Paul Kaminsky, associate editor, Mike Cotton, editor, Eddie Berganza, group editor, and Superman was created by Jerry Siegel and Joe Schuster by special arrangements with the Jerry Siegel family. And apologies to the artist, because I think I really butchered her last name, and I shouldn't because this is a beautiful book. I love what they're doing in this title, because they're not beholden to the JSA story, but they're taking an opportunity like Johnny Sorrow, classic JSA villain, bringing that character in, bringing an hour, a new hour man in, doing what they did with Jimmy Olsen with Dr. Impossible. And when I say a new hour man, Rick Tyler was Rex Tyler's son in the previous continuity as well. Uh, they're going an interesting path with him in this. It's a path that isn't far off from his unusual journey, but Man, do I really like what they're doing with this character. And I like this version of Anarchy. So they're putting yeah, together yeah. A, a strong villain group one year after Planetfall. I, how are you liking this title since the shift? You know, we had their world and we were watching it uh, form and then gradually be destroyed. And then now we're seeing them on a brand new Earth with this Genesis machine lying around, the ability to re-terraform it. And really, the Genesis machine, the problem with that is it's going to take out everything. So what what are your thoughts on this title right now? How are you liking the different groups that are, how they're shaking out? Uh, is this meeting what you liked about Earth 2 before? Is it is it stepping up from that? Um, or in the same place? Or where is it at for you? Man, I'm really digging this. This I I'll tell you, this is um, actually the death of Earth 2 was a really good thing for me. You know, just seeing them go through the rebuilding process, just seeing them go through this and just how, especially because they did that jump forward one year. You know, and I like how they're, you know, they're not doing from planet fall on where, because, you know, that could take a slow process of the build. So we already have these established cities. So now we have the, the, the villain element coming into play and the moral questions as to whether they should re terraform the planet because there is existing plant life, there is existing life on this planet. And do they really have the right? to strip everything off and reload it, you know, according to what was on earth too, you know, and I liked how when that first came out, they said, no, we can't do this. We can't kill this planet. And now we have, and it, it's, that's the ultimate struggle right now between the good and the evil is whether they're going to, you know, in a sense, destroy, but re you know, you know, recreate the world. And it's kind of an interesting moral question that, you know, it's, you know, it's kind of neat to see how this plays out. Yeah. That's the part I'm really digging about it too. This reminds me of what I liked about books like Infinity Inc. back in the day and All-Star Squadron. Uh, we, we have classic characters and classic concepts being well-crafted here, but at the same time, you're crafting some 
new concepts out of it. I love this Dick Grayson Batman. I think this is a yeah. really cool story because his journey is so different, especially with the fact that he needs that exoskeleton. I like uh, this Jay Garrick kind of getting to know Jay Garrick from the ground floor and that he doesn't really know how to be a hero. And, you know, there is something, you know, you kind of go back home and people got signs up for you and stuff like that. There would be kind of a tendency to become complacent and kind of go, hey, things are pretty cool here. You can handle things. <laughs> Everything's yeah. okay, buddy. Well, I liked with him how when in the past, the, the, the couple issues ago where they really showed the Flash was just running everywhere. Yep. You know, he really, he got burnt out, literally. He just, you know, he just needed to take a break and he needed to take it easy. And then when this new epidemic rises up, he doesn't initially want to step up to it. But eventually he is a good guy. He is a hero. He is the Flash. You know, and so you do see him, you know, right, you know, race into battle here. So I he's one of those characters I really liked where on one hand, I I I don't want to say he annoyed me, but you know, it was, you know, you're kind of like, oh, come on, dude. But then you look and you're like, you know, that would really stink. Cause you think back to just in the regular office, you know, where I'm working, you know, if someone pulls me away from this, someone pulls me away from this, you know, Hey Jim, can you help me out with this? Yeah, sure. And you get a little annoyed. Now imagine if you're running all over a planet, you know, and you're running here and you're doing all that. You'd want a break. You'd want some time off. And you know, kind of, he was one of those characters that after like two or three read throughs, you really got an understanding and a comfort with them to this point where in this issue, I'm really rooting for him and I'm backing him as he's running into battle. I totally agree with that. And, you know, the one character arc that I was really enjoying there and trying to figure out was Helena's. Yeah. And I'm a huge Huntress fan. I, I'm, and I'm going to say I'm in disbelief. I think she's up to something. Uh, I don't think she's what she seems to be. No. Nah. When she goes off with Jimmy Olsen, I don't think she really is. Uh, I think. Oof. I think she's she's trying to play him. I think she is. She was trained, you know, by the bat. She was trained, you know, to, you know, it's that keep your enemies, keep your friends close, keep your enemies closer. I really think she's trying to play Olsen, knowing that she can't outpower him. She can't outmuscle him, but maybe she can trick him. You know, maybe, you know, and I'm not going to say it. Maybe there's a level of strategy that she's playing there, you know. You know, there's maybe something that, you know, that's how I'm reading her right now. I, I hope she's not turned because it's interesting because you've got, uh, you know, Power Girl and, you know, Superman, you know, you know, Val, you know, in this universe, how they're at odds with each other. And I don't want to see Helena at odds with this, you know, universe as Batman. I'm hoping she's playing him. I'm really hoping on that. But everything is kind of playing out and listening that she's not playing him. And I'm like, Oh no, I, I, I don't want to see her as a villain. Cause I really like this character. I do too. I, I really like that the story because of the fact that it doesn't have the history of the original JSA, that there's an opportunity to play around with allegiances with these characters, thought processes you know, this is a girl who's trying to fulfill her dad's wishes, you know, or what she thinks they are. So it'll be interesting to see as this story progresses, if everything is what it seems with her, or if, you know, she will need to be able to go onto a path of redemption at some point, or if she'll just turn. I don't know. I don't know how this is going to go. What, what do you think of Jimmy Olsen? Doctor, Doctor Impossible. What are your thoughts? Hey, power corrupts. Absolute power corrupts. Absolutely. I think he he kind of lost the. I think Jimmy Olsen is lost in in that mind, you know, when he everything fused, and maybe it is the alien tech that influenced him. Maybe it's something from Dark Side that's you know bleaked into his brain, or maybe he just got corrupted by the massive amount of power he has. He's one that I definitely do not think is playing a game, but there may be the sweet, good, honest Jimmy Olsen inside there still. There could there could be an outside influence on him, but I'm not really holding my breath for it. With Helena, I'm holding my breath and hoping she actually is one of the good guys. And this is just a tactic. With Jimmy, I really think he's their main villain. And it's going to be interesting, how do you take him down? How do you, you know, what is the way to bring him down? Because he's got so much massive power there. It is funny how, you know, when you, especially when you give that power to somebody who's young 
and then people are going to the natural insecurities that a young person would have, you know, that part where he's like, you want impossible, I'll give you impossible. And yeah. you know, his fist is shaking there. I'm like sitting here like, Oof. you know, uh, th- those are the first moments where we see the turn, the Darth Vader like turn. Yeah. And, I th- and that's part of the reason why I think Helena is playing him because she can play into that ego. She can cater that. And when you're young, when, when you're young with massive powers, you, don't look at, you know, especially because he's got that arrogance and arrogance is a great weakness for a villain to have because you can easily take advantage of it without them realizing until it's too late. You know, he's really thinks he's is impossible. He really thinks that there's nothing he can do wrong, that he's thought of every possible, you know, scenario and whatnot that's going to come down because he's just that good. Well, guess what? You know, that arrogance is the opening and that's where a well you know, placed, a well thought out plan could play out and could take down, could take him down. That's why I'm hoping I'm hoping she's still on the, you know, the side of the angels. I agree. You know, one of the things I really dig about Earth, too, though, mm-hmm. is the yellow red sun phase shift. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, because that's something really neat where this planet has the two suns that are in orbit. So part of the time, if you're Kryptonian, you're super powered. But other parts, you're not. You know, and I loved how they're t- they have to time, you know, certain villain groups are timing their actions based on the red sun. So Cal, you know, so Val can't you know, deal with it or they have to deal with the fact that eh, it's, we're in a yellow phase where he's going to be a powerful. So let's play. Let's plan for this. You know, I thought that was a neat concept to introduce in Earth, too. And I, again, that's something else I'm wondering how that's going to if that's going to be a continuing part of the elements of the story. Is that going to be something they continue to deal with here or is that something they can later change? I don't know. That's. That's the part that I'm finding really fascinating. There's so many questions that come out of this of so many characters that it's just keeping me really, really interested. I love seeing Power Girl in this at the end. You know, it's all the players that we've seen during the tragedy that befell Earth 2, uh, the creation of Earth 2 back in the day, the world's finest book. It's all coming to fruition here, and it's really great to see that in this series the writer clearly understands what's going on with these characters and how to keep them interesting. This is a book that I'm hoping people are reading and it's not falling under the radar because I really, I dig me some JSA and this book has managed to maintain an interest level in me that the JSA always had. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. And again, it's, it's that different. It's the difference in the story for me. That's really lock, locking into this because I don't have that same type of baggage. Well, not I don't want to say baggage because I don't have that same history that you have with the JSA. So for me, it's kind of neat just how this is growing and how this, you know, this re- you know, the, the the reimagining of these characters and just everything that's been playing out. And I don't know. I'm really digging this story. This is the one that we haven't talked a lot about because there's so much stuff going on elsewhere, but. Every time, uh, you know, the Earth 2 comes out, I always, you know, it's one of those top of the stack reads for me just because I, I like the difference. I like you know, where this is going. And this is a nice continuation and building on the stuff we saw before. This is this story has, you know, you know, definitely evolved from the previous stuff and, you know, been, you know, honoring the past, you know, as it's continuing forward. Can we talk art ops? Oh, Yeah. Our next discussion is going to be of Art Ops number two, Riot in Suburbia. It's actually part two of How to Start a Riot. Sean (laughs) Simon is the writer. Michael Allred and Matt Brundage are the artists. Michael Allred cover, Laura Allred colorist, Todd Klein letterer, Steve Cook logo design, Molly Mahan is the associate editor, Shelley Bond is the editor. Art Ops created by Simon and Allred. So this is another one of the new Vertigo titles that we've been reading and digging. I, they had me at Michael Allred. I am a huge Michael Allred fan. I love the artwork. Um, it's something that just was an immediate draw for me. I love this book because I'm glad we waited till issue two to talk about this. I don't know if you're in the same place I am with that. Like I really enjoyed issue one, but by issue two, like I understand more of the universe and the rules and how it works. So I was really excited to visit this book and talk about it. I enjoyed issue one. Don't get me wrong. And I dug it, but I think issue two is the one. It's a great example of how a book develops 
and you start to gain more understanding of the rules and the characters and where this is all going and the premise. I really enjoyed issue two's build off of issue one. I, I'm glad you I'm glad you mentioned how with the differences of issue one and two, because this was one of those ones where when issue one came out, I was like, oh, yeah, that's, that's kind of interesting. You know, and I was really, really digging the artwork. And just the look and the beauty behind just, uh, you know, just this art style. And I was like, man, this is awesome. You know, and I think for me, issue one was more about just enjoying the artwork, you know, and the story was kind of interesting, you know, kind of hmm, what's going on, where are they going to go with this? But by issue two, you get a better groove of this. You get a better groove of what is actually going on, that it's not. And I love how issue two opens up with the, the bathroom of uh, CVGVs, where it's not your traditional Mona Lisa painting, but it is still art and it's that pop culture and whatnot that makes it art. And it's not just the, the stuff that's hanging in museums. There's, you know, there's a lot of different definitions of what can be considered art. And I liked how the fact that this is exploring and going into that, where all of this art has this unique ability, this living essence to it, if you will, and including a scum ridden bathroom in this dive bar that was just the birth of some of the greatest music ever. So I love the fact that they pulled this into classifying this as art. It was kind of a really neat thing for me. I really enjoyed as she was talking about the art, because in the beginning I saw, okay, we're pulling people out of the paintings. I didn't realize that like all, all paintings, it seems are alive. I mean, there's, <laughs> there's a life to them in the art. So, you know, the art doesn't imitate life. Art is life. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and as she's talking, the funny part was Chapman, take the baby. I need to make sure here. I need to stay here and make sure that this bathroom doesn't make a run for it. We need more time to investigate. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I like that there's different factions in the art world. Uh, and I, I can't help but wonder how many different factions there actually are. You know, we're kind of seeing that there's two main ones right now in our story that's being focused. It's not as simple as that, though. And then there's the, there's the innocent bystanders from the art world. But I'm liking more and more this world. I think I enjoyed issue one. I enjoy issue one and two together far more because it, it feels like a much larger story and I'm getting a lot of the substance to where this is going. The relationship with him and his mom, though, is really interesting. It reminds me of what I like about the relationship between Cyborg and his dad. Like, I don't think it, the issue is that mom doesn't care for him or dislikes him or anything. It's more of mom realizes the dire nature of the situation that she's in. And she's trying to take care of things and she's passionate about her job and, and what she can do and the motivation behind it. He become he comes second to that, which is always hard and unfair for a child when that happens. I like that part of the story that that's a thing in us. It's interesting with issue one. I really kind of thought he was a bit whiny and a bit of uh, annoying. You know, I was like, dude, grow up, relax, you know, but as you kind of getting issue two, you're seeing a little bit more behind what it was like for him growing up. You're seeing kind of, you're getting a glimpse as to why he turned out the way it was. You know, she definitely, she wasn't mommy dearest in that she beat him with uh, clothes hangers, but she was not the loving, you know, and caring mother. You know, and it's it's a question of you get these you know, a lot of times you get these parents who are so driven and so focused and so, you know, work oriented, you know, that they the children and their families and just every and life itself is kind of pushed to the side. So seeing him grow up that and seeing where he came from, you kind of understand who he is and what he's about. And I think that for me is part of the fascination on this. I want to see where he goes and how he grows and develops. Yeah, that's the thing. It's I agree with you. I think he is becoming more likable as the book goes on. In issue one, I think there was enough cool like art, you know, sci-fi operation events going on that it captured my interest in this world and this art ops group that I was interested in. Then they vanished. And we're left with this guy. <laughs> and I was kind of like, I was more interested in the spaceman that was like helping him out than I was him because in issue one, he was so unlikable. 
You know, it was kind of like, you whiny Brad beat him upside the head. Now I like him. Like, as the story's going on, I see his childhood. I think that was a really good opening move to kind of like, let's let's give, tell you a little bit more about this guy before you pass him off. And as the story goes on and we kind of see him step up a little bit, he becomes a far more exciting character as that goes on. I like his faults now because I feel that that's not all there is to his story. I knew that's where they were going with him, but until you see the execution, it's very hard to go, am I going to have buy-in on this guy? I'm starting to have buy-in on him in issue two. And I think that's why issue two for me was, I'm glad we waited to talk about issue two because I think it would have been a very different discussion. Oh, big time. Big time. Would have been definitely. And as I said, the first issue for me was more about just the beauty of the artwork and just in the story was second to it. You know, whereas by issue two, I really it's not just only beautiful artwork, but it's also is a pretty compelling story and pretty interesting. And I want to see I'm I'm buying into him. I want to see I want to see Mona Lisa in the modern world and see how she handles it. But I am curious as to when and if she's going back into her painting because right now there's uh, some there's a stand-in you know member of the art ops team is sitting in the painting you know and she i don't think that person was thinking hey i'm going to be in there multiple weeks at a time because it's been at over three weeks since everybody disappeared in issue one Mm -hmm. so there's been a continuing, you know, that person's still in that painting. And I want to see when eventually Mona goes back in and this other person comes out and just I, I want to see the, just these different members of the team. I want to know where they were, where they've been. I, you know, it's I, I'm really hoping that the, the team comes back and it's not just him, not because I don't like him as a character, but I do want to see his interaction now that he's got little bit more field time and he gets a little bit more understanding of what his mom has done all those years. What's his, the mother son relationship going to be like? It's kind of those are, there's all these different questions that are running through my head now with this book that I didn't have in issue one issue two. I'm, I'm starting to think beyond the page, starting to think beyond the story that's laid out asking myself, what if this yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that's that's kind of the thing that's working for me, too. I will say this. What I really liked in issue one, I liked what, you know, we had this guy and his girlfriend. The girlfriend gets killed. You know, and you see this kind of sweet story with them. The girlfriend gets killed. His arm gets chopped off. And that's when we learn that, like, you know, the, the paint can do all kinds of things. So his arm's been sort of resurrected as he's become kind of like this pseudo painting kind of thing as it's going on. But the problem is, is the art can take you over. And pretty soon the painting takes you over and you no longer exist. You know, it's kind of like a a growing fungus. So he's got to learn how to really take control of it. And it looks like that spray is kind of a, it's not a cure, but at least is a control for now. But there's something larger at work here. I did like in the, in the, in the uh, issue where we had the boxing sequence, you know, (laughs) with with the arm that like, all right, you want to try to win against me? What happens when I let it go and unleash? It's it's inter- it's an interesting world when you see what the the painting can actually do to him. Yeah, it's I agree with you, and it's funny because just that talk about the riot in suburbia, you know, and how to start a riot in suburbia. And I loved when we get to we see the safe house and just how absolutely much of a pigsty it is, you know, and just the you know it's one of those things, just the detail, the amount of disgust that they went into creating this in that. There is still, you know, beauty in the disgust. There's still some pretty neat stuff. And it was one of those things I was going through just multiple read throughs and just sort of looking at some of the detail and looking at some of the stuff that's going on. And I loved the and it was, you know, when he's looking at, you know, the very opening of it, when he's looking at the newspaper, and it was something I didn't catch until second and third read through that the statue of David is missing. You know, there's that newspaper article that's talking about how the statue of David's missing. And then later we see what happened to the statue of David. It was something I didn't notice. And then, like, there's another where there's this picture on on uh, a coffee table type thing. It's obviously a female form. And I didn't notice it at first. But then I started looking at him like, I'm pretty sure that's his girl, his dead girlfriend. So it's kind of neat that he would have a still have pictures of her around and he, he, he would have something, you know, a remembrance of her attention to detail. 
Yeah. It really, it really fleshes out um, everything you're mentioning is I love that in art and comics and it's something I like in particular, Michael Allred's art is always very detailed. And when the art gets really detailed, you get to look at little things in the background that y- it, it really is fun to go back through. You talk about your art read throughs all the time. This, his artwork's fun to go back and do an art read through because oh, there's yeah. so much to look at. That's super cool. I do find with his art, I end up catching a lot in multiple read throughs and multiple opportunities to visit pages because there's just way too much good cool stuff going on yeah the uh the character isabella the the b movie star yes. you know who's actually pulled into that kind of disco tech art world alien type of uh creation that, again that was something that you know initially looking at it you see yo know, okay that's kind of neat but then as i sort of going through i see the one alien who's kind of got the ziggy stardust look you know the david bowie look going for him you know and you just start looking and just you know the way she's drawn the way she's moving she's got the you know grooving with the the music i, I it was just it was one of those sequences that could very easily have just been, you know, when I first read through, it was a quick read through. When you sit back and you just start focusing on the different, you know, aliens and the groove and just you, you kind of you can almost feel the music going through that. I was like, man, this is awesome. Well, especially because it was this rampant music video that she had to keep from unleashing on everybody. Yeah. Uh, what a really cool premise this story has. Because I can't wait to learn more. Because you see how a music video is clearly very different than that. I like the body as a character. You yeah. need kind of this this character that has a history with the art ops is really kind of important as we're clearly putting together a new misfit version of the art ops with him kind of being the centerpiece of being able to put it back together again. I let I Talk about a sense of history. There's a sense of history there. Yeah, and it's and it's kind of neat because in issue by issue two, we're already understanding. You know, we still have a lot of questions that are coming through on art ops and what is art ops and where it came from, how it was cre- they created the whole the whatnot behind the team. But we already are start. We already are getting a comfort level with them. We're getting a comfort level with who they are. And I think you know, when you you think about sto- you know some of the great team stories that we've read over time, it's always been about. Are we comfortable with this team? Do we know who they are, what they're about? And so they're doing it's it, it we keep I keep talking about the artwork, but the story that they're crafting, they're they've used these two issues to really lock us in and bring us into who these people are. And you know, it, you start rooting for them already, and it's by issue two. And it's this is one of those titles that you know, after issue one, I was like, oh, okay, that's kind of neat. And I looked at it and I saw it wasn't an ongoing. It was an. It, I saw it was. It was an ongoing, and I was thinking in my head, okay, it was going to be one of those, you know, the limited series. I'm like, this is going to be an ongoing. What are they going to do with it? Well, now I really understand, you know, why this is an ongoing. Where they're going to go with this, or, or I have an under. I have an idea where they're going to go with it. I still in this universe, you could pull a swerve out of nowhere, and it will completely fit in with the groove of it. I was invested in it with issue one with the art. Because I'm a Mike Allred fan, so I would have kept getting it because of the art. In issue two, I'm invested of the characters, the story, the premise. They really got me. Like, I'm on board with issue two, where I, I wouldn't have said the same thing with issue one. I, I Issue one was uh, – I would have kept reading it with issue one, but it would have been – because of my attachment to the strong art and the artistic storytelling that was going on. It's the whole shebang, the dialogue, everything. I think the character development is really top notch. Uh, issue two sealed it for me. I really needed to see the character development in this for this reason. The whole thing that went on with David <laughs> and Scarlet and that whole, you know, we're, we're seeing these characters now that the art ops are in place to protect this from happening. We're seeing uh, various examples made of major artwork which seem to be figureheads in in this particular world so I, I can't wait to see what happens with all of that and where it's going but i love the idea that the graffiti the graffiti is really dangerous because it's everywhere and it can be controlled and can bring great harm but also can be a source of information yeah and i thought that was kind of a neat again that was something that i really didn't uh, grasp you know, my my first read through, I didn't really grasp just how powerful the graffiti is. Again, it's this whole notion of 
what is the definition of art and graffiti art? Well, there's a lot of people who will stand 100 percent behind the really good graffiti artists, you know, that are out there that are just this epic, you know, art you know that's being created on the streets and i love the fact that it's out there and there's then she's hunting down mona lisa you know that mona lisa is a top priority so there's there's a reason that mona is still not in the painting why she still has to be you know with the the team and still has to be in protection and i i like i I was glad that they gave us that reminder that Mm -hmm. mona lisa is still a target you know, and I thought that was a cool, um, a cool placement for it. Yeah, it was a very good use of the story. I love the Mallreds thing um, <laughs> because it was, it felt like a kind of a harken because Michael Allred was in uh, some of Kevin Smith's movies. Yeah, uh, as the artist, and it was kind of cool to see him. I don't know if that was an om- deliberately an homage to Mall Rats, but um, I did. I liked the whole Mall Rats thing. Cause I always, it's always clearly, you know, Michael Allred. It was yeah. it was a nice uh, homage to himself. I really loved uh, seeing that there. I like that kind of kind of thing in the whole storyline. It, it's you know. <laughs> The uh, suburban punk, you know, that does that does crack me up. You know, just again, the you know the because the fact that one, it is Mona Lisa wearing this and Mona Lisa doing this kind of stuff. It, I do enjoy that notion, but I also like the fact because you think about just the, the the suburban punk and just mall punk and everything that's going on because that whole punk rock genre had just that the anti-authority and the anti-thing and then when it went when you know it started going mainstream you know it was like it was a it was the death of the punk you know and so the fact that again the fact that it's being brought up and it's being made into this and it's all meshing in with the artwork because a lot of people will listen to punk rock music and they'll say oh it's just it just it's just trash you know and they don't see the artistry behind it there's good and bad and there's some that is absolutely amazing so it's kind of i again i i was so just the same connection that I was getting from with the, the graffiti and CBGBs and seeing that the, the punk rock is being brought into that. This is also artwork and the music videos are artwork and just all the art that it's, it's not just your traditional, you know, you know, ball, you know, just that traditional plain Jane, this is art. No, everything can have art. And I think that's going to be the strength of, this book and the exploration of what is art and what has power, what does it and how does it get power? I really liked the idea that, you know, she saw Photoshop pictures of herself and was like, Oh, I kind of look good in that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> cause Photoshop is such a thing now. I like that contemporary nature of it, you know, cause it's the Mona Lisa, which automatically you think of as something very classical you know, and very old and, and, and very classic art. And to see Mona Lisa kind of being very current, very today, <laughs> was kind of fun. Uh, this book has, the great thing about this book, I love the mystery aspect of it. I like that the world's quirky, but I also like that the, the world is and remains incredibly interesting throughout the whole story. I wanted to see more and get to know more. And that really was a piece that I I think really hit a home run in issue two for me was I think now that the big event happened in issue one where we got to see art ops vanish, issue two could really focus on some real strong character development from characters that we can rally behind right now as it's going on. And I really think that is what's selling me a lot more on the book now is I think my investment in the characters was stronger in issue two. And I don't, was that your experience? Oh, I'm definitely definitely more locked into this by uh, issue two. And again, as I said, I'm thinking off page. I'm thinking where they can go with this. And and once again, this multiple read throughs because especially the graffiti. Yes, you know when they were first in New York City, and I loved how you know he goes to New York, you know, and the body sees the sees that flyer for that punk band. He goes he wouldn't be that careless to go into the city. And I wasn't really thinking graffiti. I wasn't thinking that. And I'm reading this, I'm seeing him at the bar, you know, going in. And then at the end there, that final sequence where it looks like, you know, the monsters are coming in. But, you know, when you look at the previous panels before that, 
on the mailbox, you see the graffiti coming alive. On the wall, you see they're stalking Mona Lisa. And I, it, it was f- something I didn't catch during my first read-throughs because I was so focused on him. I was focused on her. I was focused on everything that was going on that I didn't take time to read and study the backdrop and see the backgrounds and see what was going on there. It was just like, man, this is kind of neat. <laughs> Yeah, I think the tour de force there was really great. I love that the graffiti, too, you were talking about that. I love that there was a uh, – once you knew what the story with the graffiti was, you could see multiple panels where you notice the graffiti's almost stalking people, yeah. and almost listening and reaching out. But people don't notice it because it's graffiti and it's artsy and kind of the thing. But as readers, you could start to notice sequences where it was almost peeling off and watching and following and I, I loved that aspect of it. It added kind of an interesting creep factor and atmosphere. As you get, like you said, as you get to know the world, you want to start watching more and looking at more of what's going on. Yeah. And I, I want to know what the backstory is behind her villain. Why is she doing this? What she stand for? Because is it just about the, you know, changing the perception of artwork? Is this an attack on artwork? Is this attack on the beautiful people? You know, what is she going, what's her, her end game? You know, and I think that's going to be kind of interesting because I don't think it's just a simple attack on the pretty thing. I want to destroy something pretty. I think it's, there's something more to this. There's something more she's trying to to tell whether it's because when you think back with her and David, she goes, how do you tell something's alive? You give it a disease, you give it a virus, you make it sick. You know, that's how you show life. So is she trying to show the world that they're alive, you know, and this is what it is, or is, does she have something else in her, in, in, you know, upper sleeves? She's, she's definitely someone I'm curious about and I want to see where she goes with this. And again, ultimately how, and can they take her down? Does the world learn about art or are they still blind to what it actually is? I like that the body was a comic book character. Yeah. And once he was let loose by his mom, by, you know, I mean, I'm sorry, our our lead character's mom. Right. uh, He had an opportunity to have a life outside the comic book to really become the hero that he was in the comic. I love that aspect of it. Like, this is, you know, this is really a thing and this is who he was and uh, that there was a life beyond that, those pages that he was trapped in. Yeah. Statue of Liberty. I'm scared what's going to happen to her. <laughs> I, that was a really good ending because I did not, I didn't know what artwork that was uh, he was going after, and yeah. that was really really cool. Now that's Izzy at the club too, right? Where, like, you see Izzy being left off, and then then is that her shopping? Yeah, and then going into the club right before when when they're when they're going into the club together. Yeah. Mona Lisa. Well, because she's got the glasses that the body gave her right. that lets her see. So she was doing a shopping trip in New York and she saw Mona. And so she just started following Mona because, you know, that's what she's got to do. You know, figure out who's, you know, the art and who's real and who's not. So that's why she went into the club following them. I love that, though. I really yeah. liked how there was, oh, yeah. I liked that there was a convergence of the characters that I was growing to love. And I liked seeing her kind of I wanted to see them meet up. Here's the thing. I, I'm so invested in these characters. I want to see them become the new art ops. I, I do too. I agree with you. I like the I like this team, but it's funny because I do want to see the mom come back, and I do want to see you know maybe art ops has multiple uh, task force, and maybe that's this will be his team, and this will be his task force, and the mom will be dealing with other stuff. It's I I, I do want to see that reckoning between mother and son. Oh, I do too. But I want to see them. Here's what I want. I want to see them become a team on their own and him to realize that this is who he was always meant to be, which is kind of like what we're seeing as readers with him. Like, I'm having a lot of fun with this. Like, these characters are really characters that I'm really finding fun and interesting. I like that it's not a traditional sci-fi ops book. I like that it's playing with all those tenants, but it's doing bringing the art world into it opens up a lot of diversity as far as what you can do storytelling wise with this, but also adds a really amazing twist that I want to follow. <laughs> I hope people are giving this one a shot because it's different. It's really different than some of the other books that I'm reading. And I think that's been a victory so far from my Vertigo reading has been how many really cool experimental titles they've got going on right now. I 
I think I should have been expecting this, but this is hearkening back to some of the glory days of Vertigo, where that's what this imprint's all about. Like, let's play. <laughs> I mean, that's really, you know, and let's play and have fun. And not every story has to be fit into this little box. You know, this is where we want to think outside the box. And each of these books should feel different, unique, and valid in their own way. And that's happening again. And I love that these are stepping up. I hope people are touching on them the way that traditional Vertigo stories have been and that the word gets out. You know, a thought that just popped in my head. Mm -hmm. What if they paint a picture of the guy's dead girlfriend? Could that picture then become alive and he could have his girlfriend back in a weird way? I don't think we understand the rules yet. Yeah. I, I, I was just it, that thought just popped in my head just now. I'm like, I wonder if they would do that. I wonder how would he react to that? Because I know I'd be a bit upset if someone did that to me, because, you know, especially someone you deeply cared about died, you know, and then hey, here you go. Here's another uh, clone of them. <laughs> I don't want that. <laughs> And see, I take that that wouldn't be her. Right. But um, I agree with you that that's something that could happen. Yeah, I, I, I think it would be kind of ne- interesting and neat and weird, <laughs> which I think is a good description of this book. Interesting, neat, and weird. And I, echo, <laughs> I, I echo your sentiments on people should give this a try. I hope they are because, you know, one, beautiful, but two, this story is absolutely getting really cool where – there, it's it's not just about a beautiful artwork for me now. It is about the story that's being told and the usage of art in the story being told. This is a great meshing of the written creative team and the visual creative team really coming together, may, becoming a creative unit on this comic. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Now, for you, you really are like a Vertigo outsider, you know, in the sense yes. that you've read some Vertigo titles and you've enjoyed them, but you haven't really followed much, if any, Vertigo, you know, where you followed it for really long times. I mean, you followed some, I'm sorry, you have things like DMZ yeah. and stuff like that that you followed, so I'm, I'm misrepresenting you. But you certainly haven't been a, a Vertigo devotee. Are you finding that you're surprised at how many of these titles that you want to continue reading? Or, I mean, are you at that place? I'm, I'm, and I'm not trying to put words in your mouth. I'm interested in your journey right now because these books are surprising me but i'm an easy hook because i was looking for more vertigo i walked into this looking for more vertigo i know you weren't in the same place because you haven't had that experience you've had vertigo titles you've liked but you haven't like looked at the line as where are you at i mean like yeah (laughs) i'm angry (laughs) (laughs) I'm really digging these things. And there's some like, dang it. Oh man, just I'm getting more titles. Cause you know, part because part of me is, you know, trying to figure out what I'm going to do. Cause a lot of times with some of the vertigo stuff that I really enjoyed, I was like, okay, I'm just gonna back off and just get trades of it. Mm-hmm. You know, and not get because part of the thing I have is, you know, time wise reading and you know, it's not just the financial thing. It is th- you know, a lot of demands on my time, but with some of this stuff, man, I'm like, I, I got to keep getting this. So I'm trying to figure out how I'm going to handle this, whether, you know, you know, whether I'm going to keep getting the paper version, I may shift, you know, my, you know, my vertigo reads may become a digital only. And oh. I may try that way with vertigo and, you know, and do, do something a little different that way, or I, I don't know, but I'm definitely, Definitely getting, you know, titles and going to keep getting titles for a while. And, you know, we're going to see how this plays out. Yeah. See, for me, it's funny. You, you were talking about that. I've done that shift too, where you kind of go to the trade thing. Here's what I found that my problem is right now because of the time issue. If I shift to trade, I start stockpiling. Yeah. And I, that's just kind of the nature of it. I There's a lot of people that listen to this show that are trade readers or hybrids, and they do both. I find that once I become a hybrid, the trade stuff tends to sit more than my singles do. You know, I want to start reading those singles because I'm, I'm into the monthly experience, and I don't – uh, I don't keep up with them as much. I, when we started the show, I was a lot more when it was Vertigo. There was a lot of Vertigo titles I was reading in trade and really loving that experience. Time, you mentioned time. I think what ends up happening in time for me, I don't have as much time for trades as I used to. So being able to follow a book monthly that I'm digging, like Art Ops, it was great to read the second issue, like when it yeah. came out and, and being able to read that as a contained issue and just kind of move on to something else. It was a nice break. 
I like uh, the crazy unique experience that it was because it was fun to like th- th- take a look at the titles that we talked about on this episode. You know, Batman Europa, Dark Knight Master Race, Earth 2. Arnaps. <laughs> One of these things is not like the, <laughs> and I like that. I mean, that was really kind of fun and refreshing. And I'm finding that these vertigo titles right now with the creativity that's behind them has given me a shot to the arm in my comic excitement, like in a good way. Cause I'm like, Oh wow. I'm just getting a lot more now. I'm, I'm a lot more experienced now. It's like broad. And it's really what I like in the experimentation with comics. It's kind of, um, I think filling up a gap that I I've had for a while and just some creative experiences. And I'm I'm hoping these titles wind up being successful just because uh, I think whether, whether I follow all of them or not, uh, at least right now, it seems like I'm like, <laughs> I'm going to have a whole lot of trouble cutting it you know, <laughs> because I'm digging them. And yeah. that's a good problem. If I do cut, it'll be a hard cut and it'll be a hard cut because of the quality. And I like that. I like that the, the, those are the reasons why the choices are, are difficult versus oh, I'm just not finding any that I really am invested in. That's good stuff. Holy caffeine. I want to shout out our show voicemail line. It's one 388 4434 or Dr. Norris on Skype. We love having you part of the show, so feel free to call in. We have RagingBullets.com, our show website. That's where we post news on when the new episodes are airing. That goes into our Twitter feed. We also have a Facebook fan page. And on that Facebook fan page, you're a pan. Did I say pan page? <laughs> we, have a, we have a Facebook fan page. I'm not too sure about the pan page, but the fan page is uh, on Facebook, and that's where you can find out information on the show as well. The Facebook group community, I want to give them an amazing shout out. They're a great group of people. Um, they, they recently did a uh, Secret Elf Christmas thing. I thought that was really cool that they did over there. Jeremy and the whole crew over there. It's become a community that has a life of its own. And I love that. I love that it's their thing. It's their community. Uh, I'm proud that we have an association with it. I love just popping in and checking and see what people are talking about. There's always interesting conversation going on. Uh, they're shouting out to news and, and it really is, it's a group of friends hanging out and they have really taken over the place. It, it's, uh, it's kind of, uh, <laughs> you and I are visitors and they own the, the, the joint yeah. <laughs> with, the, with the lack of a better thing. We do share it with infinitecomics.com. Uh, but it's really more importantly owned by that community of people that are there. And I just want to say how much I just respect and admire all of them. It's, it's kind of a cool thing. Jim and I are heading into in March. It's our 10th anniversary of podcasting. And uh, I feel proud of the people we've become associated with the silent listeners that, you know, just kind of are content to listen to the podcast friends that we've developed over time who have who call in periodically or have contributed to the show in some way capacity. Uh, the amazing Facebook group community. Uh, it, it's just great to feel like when we do this, we're hanging out with just a bunch of really cool people. And I, I, I cherish all of you. And I think it's just really fun to do this podcast because all of you, it's funny. <laughs> You know, when you, when you look at, we've been doing this for 10 years and we've had, you know, a whole bunch of stuff that's gone on in our lives during that 10 years, things get hectic from time to time. What keeps me coming back for more, I know it is for you, Jim, too. It's not just you and I hanging out because we could do this without recording. It is the quality of the people that we're associated with. We are on Google Plus. You can find us there. Um, whatever social media you're associated with, you will find Raging Bullets because we like connecting with you guys. Jim, we are sponsored this episode by DCBService.com and InStockTrades.com. What can they find at DCBService.com as we shift from November to December? We still have out there Apama, the Undiscovered Animal, Trade Paper Volume Number 1. This is by Hero Hero Tomorrow Comics. DCBS is giving a great 30% off. It's only $13.99. Plus, you know, check it out on DCBS or talk to your local comic shops. You know, this is a book that... We've had we had the people on from the movie. We've talked about the comic already. This is a great story. You know, definitely give it a read through. Give it a try. Talk to your shops. Hit up DCBS. You know, pick up this book. You will not be disappointed. This is a cool read. This is a fun read. And this is a good book. I do want to say something. If you're new to DCBS or even if you're a longtime user of DCBS, you know, there's times where my months have gotten busy and I've ordered late. 
And, uh, you know, sometimes midway through the month, uh, it's great if you're like a newer listener to the show and you never knew about DCBS before and you want to do some ordering from them. Remember, you can back order some of the previous month's stuff from them. They do still order those things. Don't, don't be afraid to shoot them an email and to inquire. They're really helpful people. They want to help you get the books that you want at the discounts that you want. So definitely check them out. If there's, you know, if you're like, Hey, the month's passed and I really wanted to get this book, uh, reach out to them. They, a lot of times they have a way to get that for you and to put that in your, in your pull list. So make sure to do that over at dcbservice.com at instocktrades.com. Their deals of the week are really amazing. <laughs> that absolute Batman, the court of Howells hardcover, 50% off only forty nine ninety nine. dollars uh, DMZ, I didn't mention this DMZ deluxe edition hardcover book five, 50% off only fourteen ninety nine. You and I are huge fans of DMZ. Uh, Lex Luthor, the celebration of 75 years, 50% off nineteen ninety nine. I zombie omnibus hardcover, 50% off only thirty seven fifty. Boy Commandos by Simon and Kirby's 45% off twenty seven forty nine. What a diverse lineup of titles oh. that they just have there. Just really cool stuff. There's something for everybody. Go go over and check out InStockTrades.com for your collected edition needs. Jim, our next episode, we're going to be talking more comics, comics, comics. We'll be back next week uh, with our second December show as uh, we jump back into talking comics. I'm really excited. That's uh, We've yeah. gotten back into the groove again, and it's time to get recording and chatting these wonderful books. So we will see you then. Bye! On November 13th, Sean Whalen was asked to stop constantly talking about comic books. That request came from his wife. Deep down, he knew she was right, but he also knew that someday he would find someone that would talk to him. With nowhere else to go, he appeared at the home of his childhood friend, Jim Segulin. Sometime earlier, Segulin's boss had requested that he shut up about his comic books and never speak of them again. Can two grown men put out a DC Comics podcast without driving each other crazy? It's Raging Bullets, the DC Comics fan podcast. With Sean Whalen as Dr. Norge. And Jim Segulin as the sensei of the whatnot and the Duke of, you know... It's a spoiler podcast, so they will go in depth into the plot line, story twists, and whatnot of the comics they are reviewing. So if you haven't read the books, you may want to come back later so you may better enjoy the show.